Yo, yo, you get yo, what's good? And welcome back to Philosophy Digestion. This is the podcast where we look at the best ideas and think pieces that history is able to remember. And also the uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs icons who came up with those ideas. Today, my name is John Gavin, and we will be checking out some of the ideas as well as the complete misappropriation of Frederick Nietzsche, 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 or however you like to say it. So this dude, Frederick, was a German philosopher and a cultural critic who published a metric button in the 18, the 1870s and 1880s before and during his complete mental breakdown that likely resulted from an opioid addiction, but also maybe syphilis. Yikes. He's most famous because he was telling everyone at the time that their religions and their values were trash, which is why all of the philosophy bros of today and devil's advocates of tomorrow love him so much. This is going to be the first of many parts that we do on Frederick because his philosophy is pretty iconic. Today, we're going to be covering Nietzsche and the phrase, there are two types of people in the world, as well as chronicling his mental breakdown and the way that his sister used Frederick's fame to support a Nazi religious authoritarian regime. But first... I'm still getting over so, like an allergy, cold, cough thing. So I'm going to go brew some tea and I will be right back. <clears throat> oh yeah, we're back. I made myself some elderberry health tea because it's got echinacea in it, which I just learned how to say, and it's going to help my throat. And as I sit here and drink it, we're all going to think about the term cultural appropriation. Or I guess we're all going to be thinking about philosophical appropriation and the co-opting of Frederick and his great ideas to push his sister's Nazi agenda. So f there are two kinds of people in the world, right? <laughs> Let's just say there's people like Frederick who think of offbeat philosophical ideas that capture some new way of looking at the world. And sometimes these people live silently among us next to the other kinds of people. Like Frederick's sister, Elizabeth with an S. People like Elizabeth know certainly what's right and what's wrong and what's fair and how to make sure that everyone is abiding by those rules and that they get their piece of the even pie that is cut. And they enforce their point of view on equality and justice onto others. Think bosses who say things like my way or the highway fathers who say well he did it legally or otherwise in order to justify their behavior and beliefs so elizabeth as much as i hate her she was a girl boss and frederick a little philosophy boy their children in germany growing up together and i guess they get along pretty well this is the early 1800s so you can imagine some little house on the prairie dresses and definitely a lot of sexism. Frederick was definitely more of a drama queen, and so he starts writing about the human psyche and philosophy. And then he says in his writing that there are two types of people in the world, masters and slaves. And here's a little life lesson from the philosopher's notebook. When people say that there are two kinds of people in the world, that's not actually true. What they mean is there are two kinds of people 
you can choose to be. Different ways of thinking about the world and choosing. If you choose Frederick's way of thinking, that makes you a certain kind of person. But if you think about the world more assertively, like his sister, then maybe you're another kind. If someone does or says something that makes you feel defined as one type of person or the other, and that makes you feel proud or ashamed, that says a lot about how you perceive the situation and the kind of person you want to become. And when people feel guilty, then they tend to get angry. People do not like to feel ashamed for making their choices. So eventually, Frederick and his sister get into a huge fight. And they become super distant when Elizabeth marries a pre-World War I German National Socialist, a.k.a. Nazi, named Bernard with an H. And yeah, where does that H go? I don't care. And neither did Nietzsche because he didn't even go to the wedding. He was pissed that all of a sudden his sister was making bad arguments like his sister's like Fred look at the environment you know who's destroying the environment the Jewish people we need to put our blue eyes and white skin and physically capable straight power team on the top and everything else is clearly evil and is destroying the environment and then Frederick's like Elizabeth what are you saying that doesn't I don't I don't follow uh it's full of hate. And then she's just all upset that Frederick is, you know, not helping the environment by literally murdering Jewish people. And he thinks that it's super entitled of his sister to project her logical deductions, her value arguments, and her point of view onto him. Because maybe, you know, concentration camps aren't actually sustainable. So Frederick writes that there are two types of people in the world. There's masters and there's slaves. And when Elizabeth, a master type, asserts her value judgments onto others, even if that means taking away their rights and choices, it's based on what she wants and what she feels is right in the world. And it's her perspective versus those doing wrong. While the unentitled or unassertive morality that falls more in line with Jewish and Christian traditions, sheep to the Lord's shepherd, forgiveness, charity, the values that mean being selfless and living a life serving others. Frederick says that master's actions as they're asserted onto others says more about them and their worldview, and the way their slice of the pie is going to be fair than it actually does the rest of the world. Anytime somebody gives you two choices, like with me or against me, right or wrong, you probably have more options than that, and this master mentality type person is creating what's called a false dichotomy. The illusion of only two options. You're with that person or you're not. And it makes decision making difficult in that black and white way. But dichotomies in general paint vivid pictures by making things look polar opposite. Did you do this or did you do that? Which is it? kind of like the American political spectrum. And just as Nietzsche says that there's one kind of person who is a master, he says there is another kind of person who is a slave. And the truth is we all act like entitled masters and unentitled slaves, depending on the circumstances and the point of view telling the story, some more than others. I also hate the old-timey phrase master-slave because those are, at this point, occupations that are illegal so pulling right close to Nietzsche a bit there Nietzsche Nietzsche 
Nippachu. So slaves, or the unentitled, see intentions and effects in the world and on people individually as good, evil, or just happening. They're often not entitled or empowered enough to make generalizations or go about making preventative laws and enforcing their viewpoints onto others. Unentitled value judgments and the people who use them do not assume any ultimate authority to define what's right or wrong. They believe that that choice is between someone else and God. They also believe that they can recognize evil in the face of it. Sometimes people like Elizabeth have terrible anti-Semitic value judgments, evil, and the vocabulary master-slave comes from the fact that those in positions of power and authority often do not allow those beneath them to assert their value judgments and make their opinions heard. They expect others to submit and accept what's right and wrong by... It's kind of like when some financial guy who inherited a comp... Okay, actually, here, I'll tell you a personal story on this one. Um, my grandma passed away, and my mom and I went to deal with my grandma's will and what she left behind. And her financial guy who inherited his company from his daddy literally just out of nowhere started raving about how much he hates homeless people and saying just like the most just like professionally inappropriate things about what should be done to and that I, he talked about locking them up he talked about kicking them off the street and we and I wasn't allowed socially to start arguing with him because he was literally sitting happy on the assets that my grandma left behind and it doesn't matter if what he was saying was offensive or not the bottom line is I had to sit there and listen to it even though I didn't want to and when people who act entitled and assertive say things they speak as though their point of view and justice are one and I don't know what that guy's goal was with sharing his hatred for homeless people with us but it was unnecessarily aggressive and it showed me his hand. So I knew how to play my cards and achieve my goals. You know, making sure that my mom and my aunt were going to be square. And we could get away safely and silently as far away from that asshole's business as we could. Frederick in the 1800s was wise enough to warn the mere day-to-day -day living as an entitled person changes you. Feeling the righteousness to tell others what to do and believing that you truly understand what is right for society. It's often argued that the subservient depend on higher powers to take care of them. I would disagree. I'd say they take lots of responsibility. They grow to expect care and compassion given and taken from their community like money time and energy are all things that we can invest in the community around us masters typically don't like the idea that people around them who contribute to their business and their culture are actually just trying to live their lives and uh, can leave if they don't like what's going down that's why slavery existed and why some people get so angry when they aren't the highest status in the room. Usually it means that others can just leave or say something back if some bullshit's going on out of the master's mouth. Being entitled to force your values and your judgments onto somebody else, even if you're you know, just making fun of the situation or telling them what they need to do to get paid. Normally, master bosses, entitled, assertive types, just expect the world they want to see because they're used to living in it. Or 
the people around them have inherited enough resources to enjoy making rules for themselves and not suffering any real consequences. Tell themselves they're traveled and they understand the local culture or whatever so that they can grow in such a way that they've decided is valuable. Frederick says the noble type of man experiences itself as determining values. It does not need approval. It judges and it grows. What is harmful in my eyes is harmful in itself and should be removed. It knows itself to be that which accords honor to things. It is value creating. Yeah, sounds like the economy. Am I right? So like somebody working in the kitchen at a Hilton in Bolivia does not see the same value in the tourist industry that the people staying at the hotel do. It's entitled on both sides, judging someone as good or bad for opposing your value when both of them have negative consequences for different marginalized groups of people who aren't even entitled to a vote at all. Regardless of your vote for president in the United States, that president will pass laws that harm people who do not have the right to vote. Y'all voted for one evil over another and fought to do it. And you telling yourself that you're a good person and not a bad person because of who you voted for president is a fool's story. And you're willing to let people suffer so you can tell yourself that your vote's the good thing and pat yourself on the back. But don't feel too guilty or we'll all go mad like Frederick. We all did things that we're not proud of because of American elections. And after doing opium alone and writing philosophy for 10 days, Frederick was also pretty fried, but his social courtesies deteriorated just like the rest of ours. And then he started mixing opium with chloral hydrate. I don't know what that chemical is, but it sounds like it would make your mind start to eat itself. And he became kind of toxic. So his friends started to cut him out. Even though he still applied to jobs and wrote and stuff, um, after his writer's retreat, it really was a spiral downhill. Do not do opium, kids. And also stop vaping. The breaking point, though, and I think this is hilarious. So he was kind of off his rocker for a few years, but what finally got him arrested was uh, he was witness to the flogging of a horse at the other end of the... And so he... So he sees this horse being beaten and he throws his arms around the horse to protect it and then collapses to the ground, disturbing probably some asshole. And it's because of his beliefs in animal rights that he was institutionalized and he was put in a home with Elizabeth as his caretaker. And when the master you disagree with is your caretaker... They make the rules, and they get to say what they want to you. It's not as easy as, you know, shutting my mouth and finding another financial pl planner who's probably better at his job. Frederick was going to have to take his sister's anti-Semitic point of view because if he disagrees with the entitled master type, he's going to be told that he's wrong, you know the Nazi German society that was developing around them before World War I. He's going to back her up because Frederick is a, the second kind of person, the opposite of Elizabeth, the unentitled, the uninsertive, that slave mentality, as Frederick called it, is based on a person's willingness to be subservient, put their desires and their goals, even their point of view on right and wrong, their principles. They're willing to put their own soul sometimes on the side in order to serve others. I often think about Avatar The Last Airbender. 
and how Aang was unwilling to kill the Fire Lord if he had to, even if that was the only choice to keep the Earth Kingdom and the rest of the world safe. He wasn't willing to sacrifice his own soul and his own principles to put others first. And yet, I think that we saw Katara do just that when she bloodbended Hama in order to save Aang and Sokka. So while Katara is willing to serve her friends and save them, even though it meant sacrificing her own values, Aang, the protagonist born all-powerful, was not. And according to the literally the stupidest philosophy article I've ever read from News Talk Florida, it says a person who's willing to become subservient in exchange for basic comforts as opposed to earning it for themselves, this slave unknowingly remains a prisoner and is not truly free. And I disagree because I think understanding one's own values and choosing to put others first is sometimes the hardest thing to do. The unentitled person values the experience and well-being of themselves and others over the rules and defining what everyone is able and justly allowed to do. And oftentimes the subservient individual will let others sing, even if it means they have a little bit more trouble sleeping. They think that it's valuable to ignore their own sometimes selfish intuitions to better serve the well-being of the group. And no, that person is not fully free then to do exactly what they want when they want all the time, regardless of other people's feelings. But in my personal experience, putting those around you first and truly first and letting go of your own individual rights and desires, it allows you to truly give yourself and then share in others' success and love. The only thing is you can't truly expect anything in return. Because if you expect it and it doesn't come, you're going to be disappointed. And if you expect it and it does come, well, you expected it. So it's not going to be a huge surprise. When you see true, authentic kindness pay you back in a surprise, fully appreciating that is one of the most magical things that humanity has to offer. And bitching to one of your clients about homeless people is not. And when goodness from those you've invested in earnestly, when that gets shared back with you, you become wealthier and rich beyond imagination. And people tend to keep their rich friends around, if you know what I mean. And I've never had much money, but I'm like the duck who dives into his safe full of gold coins because it doesn't make any sense but I'll tell you what I've got boatloads of money if you're counting the right currency and masters often get angry that uh, people can win by not playing by the rules they often see subservience and overt kindness as manipulative and if you're being kind with an expectation of being paid back, you're only going to be disappointed and you are being manipulative. So Elizabeth is all pissed off at Frederick right before their wedding. And she's like, you're only being nice for attention and to seem like you're better than me. And you don't even care about the environment. And Frederick's like, what are you saying? And after their wedding, Elizabeth and her Nazi husband, who are well-connected and educated in Nazi circles, they create a German Nazi colony in Paraguay in the year 1887. So they're like the off offshore satellite king and queen of this 
white Nazi colony in Paraguay. So there being Nazis there. Nietzsche is a sad boy, overworked college professor who's uh, not a manly or white supremacist. And he writes that he has genuine hate for his sister. And even though he might get cut off financially, his writings are beginning to become popular. And his little side hustle and passive income is finally starting to come in. So he does what the rest of the world would do. You know, if our side hustles blew up. He took a sudden leave of absence from work, went on a writer's retreat so that he could go on massive doses of opium to write a book, Zarathustra. I don't know, it's German. He wrote a long book in about 10 days on opium. Frederick gives us a diagnosis and a warning about the errors in authoritative and judgmental practices both in our relationships and in greater politics whoever's telling you what high self-worth looks like and how to treat others ask yourself if that image is being used to bully you into accepting somebody else's bullshit is it a false dichotomy? The people who have others' values thrust onto them are often the people born with nothing to enforce their views of right and wrong with. And so, to earn money and good favor, they have to submit to some fat guy in middle management and his sexist or racist jokes and his selfish behavior in order to, quote-unquote, earn things for themselves quote-unquote, contribute to society and build the kind of life that they want to live. Nine times out of ten, that job doesn't pay shit anyway, and if you weren't born ahead in the game, then you can't just depend on what middle management is willing to give you for your submissive smile. Historically, those in poverty got used to depending on and contributing to a strong community and environment around them for their good relationships, and their financial resources. The unentitled people who learn to be successful through relationships and community have to be so by compromising, being agreeable to others, and prioritizing achieving success rather than one's own profit which doesn't truly enrich oneself or the community that it affects. Unentitled morality values require you to learn how to listen and empathize and invest truly before yourself in the needs and goals of others. It's not about telling everyone that what you have is good and that you're a good person and that you're cool. It's about doing the things that build strong foundations in those around you. Get your ideas and your power and your money from expect you to hold up their practices. For men, it's act like a man. Get treated like a man. White people, be white, get treated like a white person, and benefit from the implicit and explicit racism. Just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it's right. And just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's just. But choosing to play into these things and getting defensive when called out for them, over time, it yields its fruits for those willing to sell their souls and defend themselves by telling others what's right instead of listening to pain and being subservient to others' needs. It's easy and rewarded to play tough with your gang. We learn the people of Paraguay did not welcome the Nazis with open arms. And so feeling rejected and sad, Elizabeth's husband, the Nazi, kills himself. Oh no. And that is when she returned to care for her now mentally incapable brother, Frederick. 
she had no clue anything about philosophy because she's entitled to her opinions and doesn't feel like opening her mind up to the perspectives of others, even her own brother. But she knew that his work was valuable because people paid to read it. She got a philosopher tutor named Rudolf the... <laughs> Rudolf the Red Nose Steiner had a very shitty job and he literally quit after a couple months declaring it impossible to teach Elizabeth anything about philosophy. So she's an entitled white woman in the 18 whatevers and though she didn't care what anyone else had to say, once Frederick died from a bunch of strokes and maybe syphilis, she saw no issue with compiling his work into some Nazi messaging and turning his writing into something that was huge in Nazi Germany and many American philosophical classrooms. The place that you... And if a family or a community perceive themselves as correct like the Nazis did and Elizabeth's Paraguayan colony may have you can all just kind of tell each other you're good people until you've talked yourselves into a pro-environment concentration camp that doesn't make any sense granted these groups usually have a huge existential crisis if their version of right and wrong isn't met by one of their members Alongst those at the bottom, understand that you're depending on others and your team. Whereas the entitled, Nietzsche's masters, are often born without the demand to learn collaboration. They can just get what they want, and they become entitled to say what they think. And they may go to church, and they may say they're a good person, and they may contribute to society while their blind hedge fund investments fund child labor interests. And that, my friends, is the devil. Compromising is the only option when you're poor or subjugated and you learn how to listen to those suffering adjacent to you. And you all work together because you're humans and you want other humans not to suffer. It yields empathy and builds connections, confidence, and love. It is what teaches us how to discern true good and true evil for ourselves. If we are to truly be subservient to other human beings, we cannot think, well, where am I supposed to get cheap stuff? They're all getting cheap stuff at Slave Mart. It's not my fault. And often making excuses for, well, you know, it's okay for me to do this. Wrong. Frederick encourages all of you in 2022, myself included, to find out where the white sugar from your favorite products is sourced and what the lives of the people who harvest it are like. Those With servant mentality often find compassion and sometimes guilt driving them to do that which is empathetic because they couldn't just will the things that they want into existence without considering others. They know that they don't just deserve that sugar because of their intelligence or good investments. Slave, unentitled, subservient type folks see things like CNM white sugar and think, how did that get there? And was anybody harmed in the making of this product? Nietzsche argues that defining things as good or bad goes hand in hand with feeling entitled enough to do so. And if we're just doing things without even thinking about if they're right or wrong, I think it's safe to assume that we believe that they're right, or at least justified in doing. Being entitled, entitled enough to just do whatever one wants and think that it's fine, as long as they don't see the person being harmed, that comes from years of not having to care what others have to say or feel because they have enough money and enough resources that they don't need to feel a strong sense of community to be successful. They just have it. And the narrative of the man is an obvious one. 
We need order and policing and international governments to hold people accountable for their actions. Somebody has to take up the title. In order to manifest justice in the world, violence and theft and assholes need to be locked up and shut down. That takes clarity, charity, leadership, and a master mentality because if it's going to happen, you need crystal clear goals. Like, humanity is so messed up. If you're listening to this podcast on a smartphone, like me, that we probably don't actually understand where the metals in our smartphone came from and the guilt that perhaps we should feel for where our privilege has been constructed off of. Every day we want others to see our point of view and collaborate on the world that we believe is good, but... We're often collaborating with tools that were built by the devil. Nietzsche's whole point is that neither side is right. You need both master, slave, entitled, and unentitled mentality to manifest justice, ethics, progress. This dynamic is in humanity through time and culture and in every individual person. Nietzsche's language, codes, practices, narratives, and institutions are all informed by the struggle that there's no such thing as good or evil in this world, but only a cycle of winners and losers. But we're getting there. I think that's about it for this week on Philosophy Digestion. Uh, Next week, we are going to continue talking about Frederick Nietzsche. And I am going to go into far more detail about his sister's colony in Paraguay, what happened to her husband, and what exactly her goals were. Her goals were, were with philosophically appropriating Nietzsche's work. Today's sources include Andrew La Andrew Lanham's Philosophy and English paper edited by Drs. Yerdin and Zwarg. Robert Solomon and Kathleen Higgins ebook What Nietzsche Really Said. Walter Kaufman's Philosophy on Frederick, as well as the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and of course wikipedia my name is john gavin thank you very much for listening and uh, i don't know if you've noticed but we have moved pretty much to releasing episodes on friday so thank you very much for your patience i know a couple episodes have been out late but now they're just coming out on fridays have a great rest of your day and think about 